Paris to London to Hollywood. The Da Vinci Code is everywhere, and it seems like everyone has read it. But why? What's the big deal? Why are we so fascinated by the perfect airplane read? I thought it was a great beach book. You know, it's really a good thriller. It was pure nonsense, but it was fun. Pure nonsense or truth finally revealed. What if Jesus and Mary Magdalene actually were married with children? Could their descendants still walk the earth today? Jesus and Mary Magdalene were not only an item, but also she was actually his successor. It's uh, defamatory, it's scandalous, uh, libelous, and, uh, and blasphemous. Has a secret society called the Priory of Sion existed since the time of the Knights Templar? And do they hold the secret to the bloodline of Jesus Christ? Is it possible, as the book says, that the Holy Grail was not a cup, but a person? And how did Leonardo da Vinci get mixed up in all of this? We'll examine the hard evidence with believers and skeptics alike to sort out the fact from the fiction. It has sold over 30 million copies, has been translated into over 40 languages, and has become a permanent fixture on the New York Times bestseller list. And new books about the Da Vinci Code's controversial themes are quickly stacking up. It's a conspiracy, a love story, and a quest elements that many readers love. The novel opens in Paris at the Louvre, where the museum's curator is found dead with the only clues to his murder leading to Leonardo da Vinci's artwork. The dead man's granddaughter and a Harvard expert in symbols set off on a chase through the streets of Paris, intent on solving the murder only to wind up in a modern-day grail hunt across Europe. Author Dan Brown's fictional characters are original creations, but the controversial assertions the book makes are not. In fact, most can be found in the 1982 bestseller Holy Blood, Holy Grail by Michael Bajant, Richard Lee, and Henry Lincoln. It was originally penned as an historical non-fiction book, although some critics consider it a pseudo-history. Lee claims that he and his cohorts came across what we now know as the central plot line of the Da Vinci Code back in the mid-1970s, the story of a secret society called the Priory of Sion that was created to protect the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Uh, we had no preconceptions. We had no idea where it was leading. We simply followed the evidence. It all started when they stumbled across a local mystery in this picturesque little village in the south of France, a town called Rennes le Chateau. According to the legend, in 1885, a handsome young priest named Beranger Sanier is sent by the Catholic Church to take over the parish of Rennes le Chateau. Within two years, Sonier sets about restoring the crumbling church, which was dedicated to Mary Magdalene in 1059. During the construction, he finds a hollow pillar just under the altar, which contains a number of parchments. <laughs> Author Tracy Twyman's investigation for her own book corroborates the Saunier story as it is relayed in Holy Blood, Holy Grail. After he discovered this parchment, he became very wealthy. He was spending a lot of money on himself. He also uh, was entertaining wealthy friends. He used some of the money to renovate the town that he lived in. And then he used a lot of the money to redecorate the church in an extremely bizarre way. Clive Prince, co-author of The Templar Revelation, one of Dan Brown's other primary sources, has also done extensive research on Rennes-le-Chateau. 
He believes that there is no way to know what the priest supposedly found. That's the most obvious explanation. He found something. And then you say, OK, if he found a treasure, whose treasure? Well, the problem with that area of France, with its history, is there are so many possible treasures it could be. You know, it could be the treasure of the Knights Templars, it could be the treasures of the Cathars. The area seemed to have been a magnet for people losing treasures throughout history. Holy Blood, Holy Grail claims that whatever the treasure was, this priest in a hamlet of 200 parishioners suddenly had more money than Midas, and he began throwing it around in the strangest ways. He built a tower to Mary Magdalene on the side of a mountain. And the church renovations took a swift turn to the garish. An inscription above the front door read, Terribilis est locus iste, insinuating that the church held something dreadful. Just inside, he mounted the demon Asmodeus, the guardian of hidden treasures, and the Stations of the Cross, which were each inconsistent with the accepted biblical versions, the most outstanding of which seems to intimate that Jesus was being carried out of his tomb after the crucifixion, not into it. Was the young priest showing off his inner interior decorator? Or was he trying to subtly reveal a damaging secret, one that could forever change Christianity as we know it? There is another possibility that documents led not to a treasure because there's no indication of Sonia looking for a treasure. It is possible that they contained a secret and the secret was worth money. A secret perhaps that could have been used to blackmail somebody, the Vatican maybe. We may never know for sure what Beranger Saunier supposedly learned from those parchments, as in 1917, he died penniless without ever revealing the secret. Still, the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail speculate that while Saunier may have found a treasure, what made him rich and powerful was this secret. Our hypothesis is that Jesus had a rightful claim to the throne. He was married, there were offspring. The offspring escaped with the Magdalene to the south of France. Four centuries later, that offspring or that bloodline intermarried with the royal front line of the France to produce the Merovingians. Considered the first French royals, the Merovingians were a Frankish dynasty who ruled parts of modern day France and Germany from the 5th to the 8th century AD. Agent Lee and Lincoln first came across them in the papers known as the Dossier Secret or secret documents, discovered at Paris's Bibliothèque Nationale in 1975, which included endless pages of the Merovingian family tree. And one particular page that um, stood out. At the top, there was a logo. Below that, there was Priolet de Sion, and a list of alleged grandmasters. If you assembled the data on that page, what emerged was something attesting to, ostensibly attesting, to the existence of a secret society. A secret society called the Priory of Sion, with members such as Isaac Newton and Leonardo da Vinci, which had allegedly protected the bloodline of Jesus for hundreds of years. So who led them to the Dossier Secret in the first place? A Frenchman named Pierre Plantard, who claimed that he himself was a descendant of the Merovingians and may even have been a Grand Master of the Priory of Sion himself. We asked him if he was Grand Master and he said no. Not then, anyway. Later, in the late 80s, there were reports that he was now Grand Master. By now, for anyone who has read the Da Vinci Code, it's clear how much the book owes to the details contained in Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And Dan Brown cleverly tips his hat to them with thinly veiled references. In the novel, the curator of the Louvre, who is found murdered with a strange code scrawled next to his body, is named Jacques Saunier, the surname of the priest of Rennes-le-Chateau. And this Saunier is supposedly the Grand Master of the Priory of Sion. His granddaughter, Sophie Niveau-Plantard, shares a last name with the discoverer of the Dossier Secret, 
and she's a supposed Merovingian descendant. Outside Paris, at Chateau Villette, she and Harvard codebreaker Robert Langdon seek help from Grail expert Lee Teabing, an anagram of Holy Blood, Holy Grail's authors, Lee and Bajant's names. And most famously, the headline-grabbing revelation of the Da Vinci Code mirrors the hypothesis of Holy Blood, Holy Grail. So what's the problem? Dan Brown in the Da Vinci Code presents it as fact. We do not present it as fact. We suggest it as a possibility. Though officially fiction, the mega-successful novel has caused a firestorm of controversy around the world, mainly due to its fact page, which claims that the Priory of Sion and its list of famous members are real, and that all descriptions of artwork, architecture, documents, and secret rituals are accurate. The issue for some is that fact and fiction are so closely interwoven that they no longer know what is real and what is not. And as a result, people now take tours all over Europe to follow the trail of the Da Vinci Code to find out the truth for themselves. They search around Westminster Abbey looking for clues to the mysteries in the book. They seek out the Temple Church hidden away in the back streets of London to find the missing effigy of the Knights Templar, following Dan Brown's cryptic message, in London lies a knight, a pope interred. And they often make their way to Paris, to the Church of the Saint-Sulpice, to find the intertwined P and S in the stained glass windows, allegedly signifying the Priory of Sion, and the so-called Rose Line, which the book says will lead them to the Holy Grail. With all of these real landmarks and identifiable clues, is it possible that the central themes of the Da Vinci Code are actually true? What if Mary Magdalene were married to Jesus and they did create a bloodline? Was a secret society called the Priory of Sion created in 1099 to keep this secret? And did Leonardo da Vinci, the supposed Grand Master of the Priory of Sion, actually encode the Jesus Mary Magdalene story in his artwork. Could she herself have been the Holy Grail? Being labeled a prostitute for 2,000 years isn't great for anyone's reputation, particularly Mary Magdalene's, especially when it's never written in the Bible or anywhere else. So who started this smear campaign? And what was she really like? Lynn Picknett is the co-author of The Templar Revelation, where Dan Brown may have gleaned much of his information about Mary Magdalene and the lost sacred feminine. It's quite clear that Mary Magdalene was not just the first century equivalent of the little lady who makes the coffee, you know, that sort of humbles around in the background after the men. And that, of course, is the image, if not worse, that the church wanted us to believe. She was, by all accounts, a very feisty lady, an independent woman of means, and she and the other women, actually, the New Testament says this, kept the men financially as they went around on the mission. In the New Testament, Mary called Magdalene was exercised of demons by Jesus and from then on followed him as a disciple. But very early on in the Catholic Church, she got mixed up with two other women in the Gospels in what is known as the Muddle of the Marys. And theologians believe that this is how the whole prostitute rumor got started. Pope Gregory I cemented Mary Magdalene's bad reputation in 591 AD by delivering a homily which united Mary with the unnamed women. If you look at the Bible, you can surmise the source of confusion. The passage from the Gospel of Luke about the unnamed sinner woman does come just before Mary Magdalene is first introduced. But is this just a case of mistaken identity? Unlucky placement in the good book? Or something more subversive? The church really wanted to darken her name because they knew, they knew what she was really like and they were utterly determined that no other woman would rise up through the ranks of the church and become as important, as charismatic as she had been in, in the Jesus movement. 
The reason that the church has um, had to uh, distort the, you know, the real Mary Magdalene, the real historical figure, and, and kind of invent a new version of her is, for many reasons, it has to do with the church's attitude to women generally as the, the church developed into a hierarchical organization. According to Prince, the early Christians lacked a leading lady, and eventually people demanded that a goddess figure be added to the Christ story. But the church chose the Virgin Mary over Mary Magdalene. It is as simple as virgins good, prostitutes bad, the two opposites of sexuality. You know, virginity is holy, it's the right way to be. You know, prostitution, promiscuity is is evil. It's a thing that has to be forgiven. You know, the ideal model for women became a virgin. You know, figure that one. And the Catholic Church didn't officially correct itself about Mary Magdalene being mistaken for a prostitute until 1969. But what about being married to Jesus? It appears that uh, she and Jesus were desperately in love. And I would go so far as to say, judging from the Gnostic Gospels, that in fact Mary was the, very much the power behind the throne. When the apostles all fled at the crucifixion, Mary stayed behind, risking her own safety to mourn the death of Jesus, her husband. The suggestion that Jesus was married is another reason that Dan Brown's novel has caused an uproar in the religious community. Father William Stetson finds it inaccurate at best. It's libelous. There's absolutely no foundation. In fact, uh, it may be, uh, it is a speculation which may uh, find acceptance in a rather skeptical world, uh, but it is contrary to the whole tradition uh, of the Christian church. But some people don't really see the problem with a married Jesus. Jesus' importance, historically, resides in his message. How is his message in any way compromised or diluted by the possibility of his having been married? Or alternatively, how is it in any way validated by his having been chaste? There's no connection between the two things. Is there any actual proof that he was married? The Da Vinci Code claims that proof of their relationship lies in the lesser known Gnostic Gospels found in Egypt in 1945. These Gospels, which were rejected by the church, present a vastly different Jesus from the New Testament, a more human, less divine Jesus, one who might have been married. In one of the Gnostic Gospels, there is quite a lovely little uh, moment where the male disciples go to Jesus and complain and say, just showing how dim they were actually, saying, Lord, you know, why do you love this, this woman more than you love us? You know, why are you always kissing her on the mouth? And you think, um, come on boys, think about it. If you look at the actual page, and if you could read ancient Coptic, you would be able to see that it says that he kissed her on the blank as the parchment is torn just at that word. If it was that he was simply kissed her on the cheek, why would it upset the men so much? You know, whatever it was, it really upset them. So it's the mouth, or heaven forfend the foot or the hand, because in those days that would be subservience to a woman. However, there's a problem with the Gnostic Gospels. Most scholars believe they are later works. The church considers them apocryphal. So what about the Da Vinci Code's next assertion that not only were they married, but that Mary Magdalene was pregnant with Jesus' child at the crucifixion. If he was married, there almost certainly was progeny. According to a number of traditions and some plausible sources, the Magdalene escaped to the south of France. If she did indeed do so, it is reasonable to assume that she brought progeny with her or that she was pregnant at the time, one or the other. Among the local legends about Mary Magdalene is that when she came to France, she came bearing the Holy Grail. And this is where the claims of the Priory of Sion come into play. They say that the Holy Grail was a symbol of Magdalene's impregnated womb, carrying the seed of Christ. 
The Da Vinci Code then suggests that she gave birth to a daughter, Sarah, who eventually intermarried with the first French royal family, the Merovingians, continuing the bloodline of her famous mother and father. If you're talking about a bloodline stretching over two millennia, you're not talking about a family tree, you're talking about a bloody forest. There's probably millions of people, therefore, who are related dimly to Jesus and Mary Magdalene. It could be me. It could be any of you. In the Da Vinci Code, alleged evidence of Jesus and Mary Magdalene's union continues to mount when we take a much closer look at the famous painting from the wall of the Church of Santa Maria della Grazia in Milan, Italy, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. But first, a look at the complex man behind this painting. Sigmund Freud once said, Leonardo was like a man who awoke too early in the darkness while the others were still all asleep. Martin Kemp is one of the foremost experts on Leonardo da Vinci in the world. People say Leonardo is a man ahead of his time. I think he just made much more of his time than anyone else was able to do so. My favorite thing in Leonardo is that he drew the world on paper with a conviction, vitality, and penetration, which no one has achieved before or since. Leonardo was born in Anciano, Italy, three miles from the town of Vinci, on April 15, 1452. Da Vinci, not a surname, but rather meaning from Vinci. Even the title of the Da Vinci Code irks many in the art world, as no one properly refers to the artist as anything but Leonardo. The illegitimate son of a Florentine notary and a local peasant woman, he was raised by his father in Florence. Presumably Leonardo as a child has shown talent for drawing or doing works of art, and at some point, probably via his father, who was a important notary in Florence, he was introduced to Andrea del Verrocchio, who was the leading sculptor, one of the leading painters, and uh, somebody who was employed heavily by the Medici family, who then ruled Florence. So he had a, an entree into the, probably the best studio in Florence. Legend has it that after Leonardo assisted Verrocchio by painting the angel in his famous Baptism of Christ, his mentor saw that he could never match his pupil's talent and declared that he would never paint again. Leonardo's artwork was and is remarkable, but his talents did not stop there. He also had a deep love for science and engineering, recording up to 13,000 pages of notes and drawings in his notebooks, in his backwards mirror writing. The notebooks are extraordinary, we take them for granted, but there's nothing quite like them. What is extraordinary is that a single sheet with Le in Leonardo's work may contain anatomy, physics, um, notes on nature, um, scribbles on painting, maybe a little study of a head and so on. And he was a man of contradictions, a peacenik who designed the first machine gun, a vegetarian who dissected animals and humans in order to learn more about anatomy, but was he a practical joker, as Dan Brown writes in The Da Vinci Code? He was um, an illusionist and a conjurer and a very funny man. Obviously, uh, all, he also had a, a dark side. Was he a member of the Priory of Sion, a clandestine society entrusted with a massive secret? And is it possible that he encoded his artwork to subtly reveal the secret to the rest of the world? It's quite possible that Leonardo da Vinci was trying to communicate one of the secrets that he had learned as a Grand Master of the Priory of Zion, which is that Jesus and Mary were married, but he couldn't communicate that openly, and so he had to encode it in the painting. The only true test is to examine Leonardo's paintings with a real art historian. No one in the Renaissance, including Leonardo, put codes into artwork. They put in hidden meanings, but the hidden meanings were consistent with the real meaning of the, of, of the fresco. And the nature of a code, of course, is that what you see on the surface of the code is absolutely not what you see underneath it. Codes, hidden meanings. The Da Vinci Code says that Leonardo's work is filled with secrets if you just look closely. Some even believe that Leonardo's writing was a code in itself. 
In fact, it's not difficult to read because it's back to front. It's just a, a terrible handwriting. He was left-handed. And anyone, nowadays we use computers, but anyone who writes, say, with a pen with real ink will know what a pain that is. Uh, to write with smudgeable materials, chalks, slow-drying inks, you have to kind of hook round. And for Leonardo, that was not a comfortable thing to do. So he found it much easier to go from the top of the paper that way and right across. Brown also revisits the old theory that the Mona Lisa may actually be Leonardo himself, dressed as a woman. Somebody once developed a theory that the Mona Lisa is Leonardo in drag, and to do that they took this famous image of the, the man with the beard and the beetling eyebrows, uh, which is the drawing in Turin, and worked out the face was the same proportions. Now, I think that would be a dubious exercise in its own right, but in fact that image, which we all think of as a self-portrait of Leonardo, isn't a self-portrait. Okay, so maybe not all of his works are encoded, but what about The Last Supper? What is going on in The Last Supper basically is two things, and the first is it's the story of Christ saying, one of you will betray me. But also The Last Supper is bound to refer to the institution of the Eucharist, that is to say that when Christ says, the wine is my blood, the bread is my body. According to Dan Brown and others, Leonardo's second most famous work, which was painted on the wall of the refectory at the church of Santa Maria della Grazia, may actually have a much larger secret to reveal. Because I'm familiar with the biblical account of the Last Supper, in which the young Saint John, it should be, leaning against, um, against Christ in a kind of familiar and cosy kind of way. And in fact, nothing could be further from the truth in this painting um, because the character, supposedly St. John, is leaning away, markedly away, from Jesus. And I thought there has to be a reason for this. St. John is always a young disciple and he often leans on Christ's breast and seems to be asleep. In Leonardo's painting, he doesn't do that, but Leonardo has adjusted the movements of all the disciples. I was the first person to see, as far as I know, to see um, the, the fact that it's not a young St. John sitting next to Jesus at the last, Leonardo's Last Supper. It's a woman. And also that with Jesus, um, she forms a giant M shape, presumably giving a clue as to her identity, presumably Mary Magdalene. For millions of readers, this was the first fact in the Da Vinci Code they could check out for themselves. And to the untrained eye, this person certainly does look more like a woman than a man. Definitely when you look at the Last Supper, the person sitting next to Jesus looks feminine. If you buy this assertion, then another piece of Dan Brown's art analysis starts to make more sense. He writes that the painting shows the jealousy and animosity that St. Peter felt for Mary Magdalene due to Jesus' affection for her. And if you look at Leonardo's Last Supper, you see that St. Peter has a dagger behind his back. He's got his hand on her shoulder, but visually it's actually cutting her head off. It's threatening to say the least. The more traditional understanding of this detail is that St. Peter's gesture with the knife symbolizes his famous swipe at the high priest's servant as Jesus was arrested. So that's what the knife is doing there. It's part of a very rich series of symbolic illusions. So is Jesus' right-hand man actually a woman? The reason it's not a woman is because it's an androgynous young man. Um, and it's a typical Leonardo portrayal. But if you look at other Last Suppers, St. John is often portrayed as youthful and uh, rather delicate in constitution, and it's a traditional portrayal. Sharon Newman, a medieval historian who wrote the real history behind the Da Vinci Code, agrees. There are a lot of Renaissance painters who painted John always as a young boy, and the, especially with the Renaissance styles for young boys to wear their hair long, lots of jewelry, uh, very delicate feminine faces. Brown's next big bombshell explains why there is no golden chalice representing the Holy Grail in the painting. Mary Magdalene is the Holy Grail. She is the vessel that carried the blood of Christ in the form of a child. It had 
previously been suggested by a few scholars that the grail, which initially appears as one word, the sangral, should not be broken where tradition breaks it after the N, San Graal, Holy Grail, but after the G, San Graal, which would be medieval French for blood royal. That may indicate that the Holy Grail is really the blood of Christ contained in the womb of Mary Magdalene. Most art historians do not agree with the Da Vinci Code's interpretation of the Last Supper. You don't have to have the Holy Grail in the Last Supper because that is a fanciful later invention. And anyone who argues that, I'd say read the Bible, which is what Leonardo did and see what the narrative actually is. And there's no Holy Grail. But does Martin Kemp take issue with Dan Brown's claim on the fact page that all descriptions of artwork are accurate? It's part of the fiction of the book. It's a bit naughty, but it does appear after the title page, so I simply take it as, as part of the fictional structure of the book. The Catholic Church has not taken its portrayal in the book quite so lightly. There was even a boycott of the Da Vinci Code organized by Vatican priest Tarcisio Bertoni, who charges that it is sacrilegious to say that Jesus was not divine, was married to Mary Magdalene, and possibly had children with her. It's very fashionable today, largely because of the Da Vinci Code, to believe that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married and had children and that the children went on eventually to found a sort of semi-magical royal line in France. Is it possible that for 2,000 years the church has been covering up this knowledge? The Catholic Church takes quite a beating in the Da Vinci Code. In the novel, it is speculated that the Pope was paid off by the strict Catholic group Opus Dei to give them special status within the church. Later, Opus Dei takes whatever measures are necessary to keep the Priory of Sion from revealing to the world that Jesus and Mary were married and had a child. If you forget, that most of this book is fiction, as some readers have, one might be inclined to believe that there was an actual cover-up of the real Jesus and the real Mary Magdalene by the Catholic Church. I think they would have had to have suppressed the knowledge of Mary Magdalene because she, if Christ was married to her, that implies there's a bloodline, that implies there's a rival claim. There's no evidence that I can think of in the scriptures that he was married. It's uh, defamatory, it's scandalous, uh, libelous, and uh, and blasphemous. Despite the lack of evidence, some still believe that it is more likely that he was married. It would have been unusual for a Jewish man at the time to be single, especially Christ's age, 33, he would have been married at that point, most definitely. So who is right, the church or the Da Vinci Code? Christianity is a historical religion, and the historical fact is that as God's plan called, Jesus was not married. And it's not up to us mere mortals to question God's plan. The church invented a particular image for Jesus, that he was this uh, divine figure, you know, the son of God, literally God, God incarnated. And once they've got this, this image of Jesus, they kind of have to strip away the, the humanity of Jesus, the humanness of Jesus and it doesn't want the complications of him having a partner or a wife. It doesn't want the complication of him having children. You know, we haven't come up with a marriage license. Nobody was invited to the party. You would think that the wedding would have had been a real blowout affair, but no, nope, there is absolutely no proof that Jesus and Mary were married. Whichever story you believe, the novel certainly contradicts the traditional beliefs of the Christian church and portrays one Catholic group, Opus Dei, in a very unflattering light. Most readers will remember the albino monk Silas, an Opus Dei numerary, with a penchant for pain, whose blind obedience to the church ultimately leads to his death. Father William Stetson, an Opus Dei priest, finds Dan Brown's portrayal of Silas ludicrous. Opus Dei is very badly and libelously and slanderously portrayed in the Da Vinci Code. The author takes an institution and makes a 
caricature of it in order to create excitement in his mystery story. That he would talk about uh, albino monks, well, I mean, there are no monks in Opus Dei. It shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the very nature of Opus Dei. And above all, I mean, he's a, he's a totally immoral person. So what is the real deal with Opus Dei? Blessed are you. Opus Dei is a 77-year-old institution of the Catholic Church which seeks to awaken in Christians a authentic desire to live their Christian life, to integrate their faith and their work and their family life. On the infamous fact page, Brown states that Opus Dei is a deeply devout Catholic sect that has been the topic of recent controversy due to reports of brainwashing, coercion, and corporal mortification. But are these reports true? I joined Opus Dei while a sophomore in college, and um, the reason I got involved was because an Opus Dei numerary asked me on a retreat. And so after that time, I became more familiar with the members and I attended functions at the Opus Dei houses. And then over a gradual period of time, my involvement got deeper. According to Father Stetson, one's level of commitment to Opus Dei is a completely personal decision. It's based upon freedom, uh, the freedom of people in joining and the freedom of people to leave. Not so, says Tammy Di Nicola. The pressure on her at age 19 to become a celibate Opus Dei numerary increased exponentially. She was finally told, but if you say no, you'll be not doing God's will your whole life. And you may even be damned and um, you won't have God's grace. Tammy did end up joining Opus Dei as a numerary and was initially proud of her total obedience to the faith, only later referring to it as blind obedience. You know, typically entire salaries are handed over, all of your reading, watching of television and radio is censored. It is this intense devotion which Dan Brown latches onto and embellishes in his character Silas. His brutal use of the psyllis, a spiked belt worn around the leg, and the discipline, a braided whip usually used once a week to remind oneself of Jesus' suffering on the cross, are some of the more memorable images from the novel. Opus Dei numeraries will wear this on their thighs for two hours each day, except for Sundays and feast days. Within Opus Dei, they explain that you need to do penance and mortifications in order to grow closer to God. Corporal mortification uh, has been practiced uh, in the Catholic Church for centuries. So corporal mortification is real, but that doesn't change Opus Dei's main beef with the novel. Its appearance on the fact page leads readers to conclude that everything that the pitiful Opus Dei character Silas does in the book, including extreme overuse of the psyllis and discipline, would be condoned by the real Opus Dei. I don't believe that uh, anybody would be allowed by their director who moderates all aspects of the spiritual life of the individual freely to mm, use uh, these means of corporal mortification to excess. Di Nicola finally did leave Opus Dei after her parents and an exit counselor conducted an intervention during a break from school. And while she is still a devout Catholic today, she feels that she is much better off without the affiliation with Opus Dei. So I think that there's something systemically wrong with Opus Dei that it, at the heart of it, it operates more like a cult um, in its practices. There will always be differing opinions about a group with as strict beliefs as Opus Dei, but what about its portrayal in the Da Vinci Code? I think that in the Da Vinci Code, Opus Dei is very much sensationalized, but what was portrayed accurately is the blind obedience that exists within Opus Dei. Opus Dei aside, there is no question that the Da Vinci Code tramples on the traditions of Christianity, upsetting many who hold those beliefs so dear. The accusation that the Catholic Church has been engaged systematically in a cover-up of the fact that 
and Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and that they had a daughter. It's an attack on the basic foundation of the Christian church. I don't think the church has been covering up anything for 2,000 years. I don't think the church is competent to do that. Definitive proof is rather hard to come by when dealing with a 2,000-year-old claim. Still, the strongest argument against the Da Vinci Code's hypothesis that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and had a child is that it is never mentioned in the Bible or any other historical text. It's never been a part of the Christian tradition from the very beginning that Jesus was married. And this is held by the Catholic Church, the Church of the West, by the Orthodox Church, the Church of the East, going back to the earliest days. I think anything is possible. Uh, Jesus could have married. Jesus could have fathered children out of wedlock. There could certainly be a bloodline today. There's just absolutely no evidence of it, no proof of it, no hint of it, nothing. So the central conceit of the Da Vinci Code, that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married and had children, is possible, but not likely. In the book, the only real evidence offered for this revolutionary secret is the number of people dedicated to keeping it and the lengths to which they would go to protect it. So what about that mysterious organization, the Priory of Sion, and those cryptic documents, the Dossier Secret? Do they still conceal and protect the evidence that would reveal that there is a bloodline of Jesus in the world today? In the end, the trail of the so-called facts in the Da Vinci Code leads us back to Dan Brown's main source, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And that story begins in Rennes-le-Chateau with the legend of Beranger Saunier, that young country priest with the unusually sudden cash flow. Remember those parchments he supposedly found underneath the altar? Did they reveal a giant secret, one that was worth a huge amount of money to someone, perhaps the Vatican? Well, it turns out that whispers of hidden treasure and lavish payoffs may have just been a hoax. It's true that he suddenly seemed flush with money, but records reveal something more down-to-earth than holy blackmail. Sonier was actually trafficking in masses, taking money for ostensibly praying for people, and in his case, he promised more masses that he could say in a lifetime. He would charge one franc a mass, which doesn't sound like much until you realize that people were sending in checks for 250, 300 francs for 300 masses, which, of course, he never said. Many believe that that was how he became so wealthy, not by finding secret documents or a hidden treasure. But Richard Lee still surmises that there is more to the story. No matter how extortionate you are, no matter how much you charge for a mass, you're not going to make that kind of money from trafficking in masses. We do know that after his death, Sonier's property was bought by a chef named Noel Corbu. French journalist Jean-Luc Chaumet was the first to break the story that the supposed Rennes-le-Chateau treasure was really just a marketing ploy. Corbu transforms it into a hotel and called it l'Hôtel de la Tour and it is him who is really going to give the first push to the story. He is going to develop the strange life of Béranger Saunier as somebody who discovered a fantastic treasure. My guess is Noël Corbu was uh, an enthusiastic supporter of the legend of Rennes le Château because he had a hotel in a very inaccessible place and he needed the tourist money. So who was Jean-Luc Chaumet's source? It turned out to be none other than the shadowy Frenchman Pierre Plantard, the so-called discoverer of the Dossier Secret and a central source for Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Plantard admitted to Chaumet that he had visited Rennes-le-Château in the 1950s, heard the Saunière treasure story, and began to write himself into it. Plantard very quickly shows himself off like somebody who has an ambition. We can see that there is a megalomaniac, a mythomaniac, and a perverse side of his character developing. Plantard claimed to have discovered the secret documents of the Priory of Sion in the Bibliothèque Nationale in 1975. 
but a closer investigation revealed that he had not so much discovered them as created them out of whole cloth. I mean, if I had secret documents, I would not put them in the Library of Congress and say, these are secret documents, everybody. Some of the dossier secrets showed Plantard's breathtaking audacity. He included pages and pages of the Merovingian family tree, which conveniently included a new member of the family, himself, insinuating that he was the rightful heir to the throne of France. Et on s'est aperçu que toutes les généalogies euh, en question... We realized that all of the genealogies in question had been copied. And evidently, he had added his name over here and over there. There's no question that Pierre Plantard was not descended from the Merovingians. But Plantard's master stroke of deception and the key fact in the Da Vinci Code was the list of the Grand Masters of the Priory of Sion, including Leonardo. The list of Grand Masters in the Dossier Secret is a, a very neat and impressive piece of work. But when you do actually get down and really analyze it, it is basically fiction. Plantard took this group of documents, labeled them the Dossier Secret, and filed them in the Bibliothèque Nationale in the 1960s, only to conveniently unearth them in 1975. And Plantard met with the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail in 1979, in hopes of pushing his version of the Priory of Sion even further. This is where that fact page at the beginning of the Da Vinci Code really runs aground. It states that the Priory of Sion is a real organization founded in 1099, and that the parchments referred to as the Dossier Secret were first discovered at the Bibliothèque Nationale in 1975, when really Plantard just brought them back into the limelight. There is absolutely no proof that there was any, uh, any Priory of Sion or any secret society that was founded to protect a secret about the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Nor is there proof to corroborate the central claim of Holy Blood, Holy Grail, that if Pierre Plantard was supposedly a Merovingian, that that would mean that he was also a distant relative of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. Even Plantard didn't take it that far. He said, Messieurs les Anglais. He said, the Englishmen think that I am a descendant of Jesus. But naturally, that is a farce. But he protested pretty softly. If there were proof, there would be no books, there would be press conferences, and uh, all we have got is evidence, and evidence is not proof. Evidence is subject to interpretation. So now it all comes together. The Priory of Sion was not created in the 11th century, but rather the 20th, and therefore was not created to guard the bloodline of Jesus. The Priory of Sion is a front organization. It's a shell, it's a sham. The Association of the Priory of Sion is a commonplace association which is common in France, but has nothing to do with the Templars, nothing to do with the secret history of France, and it has nothing to do with an eventual secret Merovingian dynasty. And Leonardo was never a member. I think there is zero chance of Leonardo being a member of the Priory of Zion. But could there still be secrets in his artwork? There is no case for saying there are kind of secret messages which are waiting for Dan Brown to come along to decode. Real or not, there is no denying that the speculations in the Da Vinci Code make for compelling reading. When it comes to the evidence, however, its claims to the facts are little more than a house of cards. It may appeal to a skeptical world, and it may make interesting reading in a detective story, but it is not uh, any, anything approaching uh, reality or scholarship. A lot of people who read the Da Vinci Code don't necessarily take all of it to heart, but their curiosity is piqued. And so I think that's good for the church. I think it's good for society. One must remember that it is a novel. There are some facts in it, but not as many, I think, as he claims. I thought it was a great beach book. It was pure nonsense, but it was fun.